What's up, everybody? Welcome back. It's me, Quincy Lanier Gosfield, founder of 21 Days Black. I am hoping that you guys have uh, had a nice month. It's been a while since we had our last live, but I'm really, really excited about uh, tonight's live. But first, let me introduce some of you all to who we are. So we are 21 Days Black. Uh, 21 Days Black is a Black economic empowerment challenge um, that lasts for 21 days. It's a 21 day challenge focusing specifically on the financial empowerment and wealth building in the Black community. Uh, we curate and we disseminate life-changing information that focuses on Black wealth and empowerment from both a historic and a contemporary perspective. And we provide simple everyday tasks that help develop conscious economic practices and decision-making in the Black community. That's what we're about, guys. This is free of charge. This is, there's no catch. There's no, no cost whatsoever. However, if you would like to donate to our program because we do have costs that are involved. You can support us by going down and see the little scroller at the bottom where it says 21 Days Black Cash App. You can donate whatever you want. That helps us bring you programs like today's. Today's program is extremely special to me. Um, it is Ordinary Adrian's Everyday Guide to Financial Planning. Um, I say Ordinary Adrian because this young man here is someone who's near and dear to my heart. As a matter of fact, he is my brother-in-law, so that we are real, real, real clear here. Um, and he is someone who has inspired me throughout the years because he is such a pro with his finances. Um, and I've watched him grow his finances. I've watched him secure uh, his financial, uh, the financial security of himself and his family and the people around him. Um, and he has always been someone that we could go to for advice. And Adrian wanted to contribute to the group um, with ordinary Adrian. <laughs> so um, I will first say Adrian is an average guy. He's a husband, a father of four, a 17 year director of IT and security, and he has a master's in business administration and a bachelor's in information system. So he is not a licensed financial advisor. He is a guy. This is why we call it the practical guy, because he is a it's an everyday guy who who learn who learn exactly what needed to be done to secure his financial um, security. So um, Adrian has created a framework of actionable steps that have helped his family and his friends take control of their financial future. Um, and Adrian wants to share, that's Adrian right there. I just popped him up on the screen so you guys can see his face. Uh, he wants to share his step-by-step -step wealth building practices from a practical and an experienced everyday perspective. Um, when I think about Adrian, I think about this, uh, this age old adage right here. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I'm guilty of that myself, and many of us are guilty of that. And one of the things with this group is, although we are focused on empowering ourselves, our community collectively, you really can't empower a community if you have not yet empowered yourself. Um, so the change always starts at home first. And so that's why we're really excited uh, to bring Mr. Brown to the live stream, guys. So please welcome, welcome. But before so before that, let me see. Any of you guys that are that are watching, currently watching, if you would like um, for your comments to pop up on the screen, I provided um, in the comments section a link. It says, "Allow us to show your comments." Log in here. So also remember, there is a slight cricket. My hat's a little cricket, but there's a slight delay um, between your comments and the live. So we receive your comments maybe a few seconds after you've probably posted them. So we will take some comments um, after each section um, to answer, but you know, we're gonna give you a breather. We're gonna take a moment so that it uh, catches up so that we're all on the same page. All right, guys. So please, 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 please let me introduce you to the man of the hour. And this is the first in a series 
of talks by Mr. Brown. So this is basically an overview of what you guys will be able to uh, jump into in, in more detail as the month goes on. So please welcome Mr. Agian, 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 Mr. Agian Brown. <laughs> Adrian Brown. <laughs> Thank you, Quincy. I appreciate the intro. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll get ready to jump into the slide deck here in just a moment once you have that up on the screen for us. Uh, so you guys, again, thanks for the intro. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I'm saying I am going to step out, guys, and I'm going to put you in the hands, the very qualified hands of Mr. Brown. So you go ahead and take over, Mr. Brown, and you just call out your commands, and I got you on this end. Okay, sure, appreciate it. <clears throat> all right, everybody. Well, uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you all for taking a little bit of time out to, to hang out with me tonight. Uh, just explore personal finance, and, and as Quincy mentioned, looking forward to your questions. You know, I want to uh, try to make this as dynamic and interactive as possible. It always makes it a little bit more engaging. Hopefully, I can answer some questions that maybe you've had over the years, or maybe that will be prompted just from from uh, you know this walkthrough tonight. Um, so Quincy kind of already shared a little bit about me. Uh, as you said, I've been in IT for for about 17 years, right? Um, Director, I'm currently a director of IT and security for a company here in Austin. Uh, I've had a successful and rewarding career and I, I still enjoy what I do. Um, otherwise, as Quincy said, I'm, I'm just an ordinary guy, right? And, and we wanted to really underscore that because, um, you know, there's, there's, it's not about necessarily how much money you make. Sure, that helps, helps you save faster, helps you do some other things. But ultimately, the concepts that I want to share with you is something that you can start applying in your life uh, just like I did, right? Um, once again, not a, not a financial advisor, right? I don't have any licenses. I, I don't have any certifications or anything like that, right? That is my disclaimer. Uh, this is simply personal finance uh, information. It's knowledge. I want you to take it, use what applies to you, uh, use what works. Um, I always tell people personal finance is called that for a reason. Uh, it is personal, right? Your situation is different than mine. Uh, everybody's unique. Some of us have families. Some of us don't. Um, we all have a mixture. So we got to figure out what really works. So, um, of course, feel free to take what I say, throw it away, uh, or take, take what you think is important and could work for you and, and apply that in your life. So, uh, that being said, right, I'm not a, not a uh, financial advisor, not a certifications or anything like that. So, why should you listen to me? Uh, well, collectively, I studied personal finance and real estate for over 15 years. Um, it started with me with a, with a great book 15 to 18 years ago, and that's kind of what led me down this path. I found it interesting and exciting, and I try to share this information with anybody who's interested. Um, so that said, I have nothing to sell. There's no incentives uh, for me for doing this. Uh, I don't have any products or services, again, that I'm gonna pitch. I'm just excited about personal finance. And more importantly, I mean, personal finance, it's, it's not well known, right? Uh, it's generally not taught in school, and oftentimes it's simply information that is learned around the dinner table. But even then, a lot of people don't get that experience. and if we're being honest with ourselves, uh, you know, black and brown communities and families, uh, it's even less well known, right? We like money, but we don't necessarily know money, right? And where a lot of that stems from, black Americans, right? We've been denied education or maybe had low quality education and that has led to uh, lost job opportunities or low income job opportunities. And if you don't have that, then you can't really even start thinking or planning for something like home ownership. Um, and even then, some folks did apply, right, for home ownership, and, and obviously some folks have gotten homes today, and that's great. But even then, maybe it was subprime uh, loans, and that also led to the financial collapse in 2008 with the housing market. So uh, there's a lot of reasons, right? There's a multitude of reasons, and this is always multifaceted. But I guess the point is, a lot of black and brown families and again communities have not had a lot of wealth to manage, right? So you come to the table, and it's like, well, um, you know, that that uh, personal finance discussion over dinner time probably skipped your your household just as it did mine. Right. So because of that, there's actually a major gap between people of color and white families. And we're going to look at that a little bit later. We'll touch on that and kind of show some stats. Uh, but if what I can do is try to bring some of this knowledge to you and help you, one, get your financial life on track, but also hopefully you can then take this and, and share this with people that you care about. Um, so uh, what's my objective? All right. So a few things. One, as Quincy mentioned, I, I, I pretty provided um, I'm going to provide a framework here. Um, again, 15 years of studying personal finance and real estate. Again, I found it interesting, but there's a lot of complex topics out there. So I, what I'm trying to do is really distill that down, share, share with you those concepts so you can get onto a path of strong financial health. And so what I want to do is help you understand what each concept is, why it's important, and then how to do it. 
So at the end of this, I'm going to provide, and as we go through, I'll talk about the actions. But at the end, I'm also going to share with a list of concrete actions that you can take if you think that this is going to be good for you. Um, so again, before we uh, before we jump in, remember, please ask questions along the way. And what I'm going to do is try to pause in between the uh, the different slides, and we'll try to share, you know, spend a little bit of time to answer those. Um, so that said, let's go ahead and go on to the uh, to the next slide, please. So what we're going to talk about here is, um, yes, here we are. So learn to control your money or your money will control you. So, so that's sort of the theme here. Uh, and the reason I make that a theme is because oftentimes it seems like folks are living paycheck to paycheck. There's nothing left over. Uh, it's hard to get ahead. And because of that, we're always thinking about how, how can we afford that next bill or what's going to happen if there's an emergency, right? And the only thing that does is it causes stress, anxiety, and worry. And so what I want to do, again, is give you some uh, some knowledge to really help you get your finances under control so you can have peace of mind, right? And so after this, right, after we go through today's series of topics, you're going to have some actionable steps that you can start to employ. So then after you start to get your money under control, next topics will, will then go in the future will be things like your 401k, right? How can you learn to put that money to work for you? And what I want you to start doing is trying to shift your mental uh, or your mentality of thinking about every dollar as an employee, right? Once you learn how to control your money, then you can start to put it to work for you and it starts to multiply, right? It brings back more dollars. Um, so again, that's future, but let's start today with, with a bunch of concepts and we'll, we'll start with, um, actually next slide, we can probably keep this moving here. We can start at the beginning. And oftentimes when I start having conversations with people, I say, hey, where do I start? Well, I'm gonna say we need to start with your emergency fund. Um, so let's go ahead and, and move on to the next slide, please, Quincy. And with that, instead of starting with just an emergency fund, I want to break that down and take that just a, a little step, uh, I guess, before that. And so what I'm going to say is a mini emergency fund. So my goal here uh, that I share with you is try to aim to get $1,000 in your checking account. That is more than your monthly bills. And the objective here, the why behind this is so you can prevent using credit cards. So, okay, let's say your bills are $2,000 a month. Simply add 1,000 on top of that and try to make that your goal. Try to always keep that $3,000 in this example in your account. This way, if there's ever some, uh, you know, some small emergency, right? Maybe it's a flat tire. Uh, maybe somebody has to go to the, to the doctor's office and there's, you know, 40 or $50 of copay, or maybe a family member has an emergency and you need to go get some, get some cash for them. Having that extra buffer in there allows your bills to continue to still come out of your checking account automatically. And by the way, that's going to be a theme you'll hear from me throughout this entire uh, presentation today is automating everything. Uh, but having that thousand dollar buffer allows you to do those things, right? Have that car repair, get that doctor's visit, uh, do whatever you have to do without having to go get a credit card. Um, and the reason why is if you don't already know, credit cards have a lot of really high interest, right? And I think that's what causes a lot of people to get into financial debt. That interest, when it's working against you, when compound interest does, is not working in your favor, it can really make it challenging to get out of debt. And so one other why to think about here, as I've uh, shown here on the slide, is 60% of Americans cannot afford a $1,000 emergency, right? And so obviously there's there's uh, things that are bigger than a, a flat tire or a doctor. Uh, uh, office visit, like, you know, car incident, and you have a $500 deductible, right? So if you line up, right, thinking about that, if you line up 10 Americans, you, you know, you count six of them, and there you go, that that number, that statistic cannot afford a $1,000 emergency. So my goal is to get you to give yourself that buffer, get that $1,000 in there, and put those credit cards to the side just for a little bit until we can start to understand how they work, and we can plan a little bit better. So moving on to the second topic here on this slide, let's say you do that, right? You establish that that thousand dollar buffer. Well, what do I do next? Well, next, what I would suggest is start paying uh, off that high interest debt, right? And uh, this is a bit arbitrary. I said anything over six percent. That's just kind of you know it's, it's what I feel is about right. And I say that because oftentimes student loans and uh, maybe your your mortgage, if you have a mortgage, if you're a homeowner, a lot of times that's that's low interest debt, right? Maybe it's five percent, you know, maybe it's four percent for your home. And so what I'd rather you do is focus your money and your efforts on paying off this high uh, interest loan debt. So if you think about that, again, credit cards as an example, it's very common to have a credit card with an interest rate between 15 and 25 percent. And that's huge. Right. And I'm sure some of you out there are like, I really want to pay off this student loan or hey, I really want to pay off my mortgage. I want to you know, own my home free and clear. And, and that's great. Right. Uh, your mind's in the right place, but your math is in the wrong place. 
right? Those two don't really mix. So if you have the opportunity to pay off 5%, you know, debt at 5% or debt at 25%, you should probably pick the higher rate because it's going to drown you, right? That's what's going to slow you down. And again, that's just credit cards. There's payday loans out there and those are notorious for crazy interest and oftentimes have interest rates up to 400%. Right. And that's what I call financial quicksand. You know, I read that the other day online and I thought that was the perfect word for it. It's financial quicksand because by the time you start to pay in a week or two, it's built up so much interest that you're, you're looking to try to go get another loan from, you know, whether it's from a bank or a family friend or get another payday loan place just to get out of the first one. And so it really just starts uh, becoming a slippery slope. And then you say, well, why is that? Well, once again, it's it's compound interest and it works against you. And, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And it's again, not, not trying to to make anybody's head hurt and trying to go back to, to the compound interest. And so uh, anyways, on this topic of prioritizing paying off your high interest loans, there's going to be a few actions I would, I would suggest. So the first is if you have a credit card balance, right? Meaning you're carrying a balance month to month, that is what you want to get down, right? So you want to uh, start paying that credit card off. And let's say you have two or three cards. Um, generally speaking, I would say, look at your two or three cards, look at your statement and figure out the one that has the highest interest rate, right? If you have two cards and one is 15% and one is 20%, I personally would start paying the one that's 20%, right? It's got the highest interest rate. It's the one that's pulling you down the most. And so look at that. And if you have multiple cards and you're like, look, I, you know, I can't find this interest rate. It's too much of a headache. Just pick a card. And I'm going to say that because any one of those credit cards that you have, they're probably all much, much greater, much higher interest than, again, your student loan or your home loan. Okay, so now what do you do, right? You got a card in mind, you're ready to pay it off. So the next action is you need to make what they call principal payments, right? It's principal only. And the difference is, right, if you swiped your card for $1,000, maybe now it's got $200 of interest on it. So if you just think that you're going to make an extra uh, loan payment, right, maybe you pay $50 normally, but now maybe let's say you're going to double it and you're going to pay $100 a month. Just doing that doesn't actually pay off the principal. It pays off the interest. So what you want to do actually call up that credit card to make a principal only payment how do i do this right and they might say well you have to go to this online portal and maybe there's a checkbox that says principal only then you can make the payment others uh, other card companies might say well you need to send us a check and at the bottom where it says memo you might have to write principal only then you can send the check in uh, so just know that if you just go to make extra payments that's going to go to interest and that's not going to help you get out of debt as fast right um so that's that's an action right so pick your card Give them a call and ask them if they accept pre, uh, sorry principal only payments and some might say no but i think generally these days many will will accept that but you need to do it in one of those ways uh, that i mentioned all right so your next action now that you've done that is to get that account to zero obviously and let's say you do that right once you get that to zero i have a couple of other requests that i would suggest to you set up auto pay in full right you never want to get there anymore and if you're already at a zero balance because you've just paid it off setting up auto pay isn't going to hurt anything because there's nothing on there um, one thing to consider, uh, I'm not fully against credit cards because it's part of the game that we have to play, right? To build credit, to get a car loan or to get a home loan. So if you must <clears throat> take one of those payments that you are required to pay every month, maybe it's your mortgage, maybe it's your rent, um, and be, you know, be careful with mortgage, maybe, maybe forget that one, but take a utility bill, right? Or car insurance and put that on that card. And after that, put that card in your drawer, right? Don't look at it. Just know that your car note is going to the area, your car insurance payment and it should be set to auto pay in full. That way you never have to deal with that again, but you know that you are still making positive hits to your credit because you're paying off that payment from your credit card or whatever it might be. Uh, so that's kind of it on this slide. Now I wanna pause and if Quincy, if we have any questions uh, from, from the viewers, then let's go ahead and talk about some of those. Otherwise we can proceed to the next, uh, next slide here. Let me see if we have any uh, questions. I see we have a comment from April Vonner. Can you see that, Adrian? Uh, I cannot, but hold on. Let me just uh, pop over here. So the comment is, I ruined my credit by not using any credit cards for several years. I have since recovered. Yes. Okay. No, that's good. And that's uh, it really is a good comment. And that kind of goes to what I was saying here, just as we wrapped up that last point, it's important to get that card down to zero. And for people that are not good with using credit cards and managing that, that's why I say, set it to auto pay, put a bill on it that you must use like your car note or your insurance, and then put that in your drawer in someplace safe. And that way you still continue to use that card. And ultimately, 
it doesn't matter, right? Some people just say, well, I know I'm always going to keep Netflix. I'm not doing away with that. So I'll put Netflix on there and that's absolutely fine. It could be a $10 a month charge and you just pay off that $10 every single month in auto pay. And that's going to show those positive hits to your credit. And that way we stay out of a situation like April mentioned where her credit, uh, she stopped using credit, right? And that essentially kind of, uh, it doesn't show a good payment history if, if there's nothing to show. Right? So thank you, April. That's a, that's a good point. I appreciate that. So I'm going to bounce and bring back up your presentation. All right, cool. Let's do it. <clears throat> All right. So a little more savings. Uh, so before we get there, right, before I start talking about the emergency fund at the bottom of this slide, let's make a quick pit stop and talk about APR. All right. So APR means annual percentage rate. Now, that's misleading because it's actually simple interest, and that does not include compounding. If you're starting to hear, uh, you know, I've probably already mentioned the word compounding a few times now, and that's because it's all around us. Uh, so APY, which is the annual percentage yield, that is actually the true rate, and that does indeed include compounding. And what is compounding? Well, really, it's interest on interest. So I'm going to give you a quick example. And again, I, I don't want to make anybody's head hurt for math, so we're going to make this pretty simple. Uh, let's say I have $100, and I'm going to loan you $100 for two years, and I tell you I'm going to loan it to you at a rate of 10%. All right, so 10% of $100 is $10. So that means at the very end of the first year, you're gonna owe me $10 on that 100 that I loaned you. So now we're up to 110%. Now, as we start year two, that's what the principal is, 110, right? We've compounded that $10 interest. So now by the time we get to the end of year two, 10% of 110 is $11, right? If we kept doing this, you can see that we would keep taking that $11 in year two and we'd add that, so now we'd have 121. Right. And that is how compound interest really starts to uh, increase. Right. Either your savings or your debt. Right. Because compound interest works for us in two ways. Right. It can work for us, make us money or it can work against us and create us and pull us down into debt. So. Right. You're probably thinking, well, we're talking about an extra dollar. Right. We went from ten dollars to eleven dollars. The thing is, uh, in my example just now, that was compound interest for annual. Right. Annual compound interest. It's very common that some loans do monthly compound interest. Right. So if you can think of that same scenario. But now from January to February, you're compounding that, right? And then from February to March, you're compounding a different amount. That really starts to get up there. So let's go back to credit cards. It's very common that credit cards actually compound daily. So every single day, maybe they're adding an extra 13 cents. Then it's, then it's an extra 17 cents, right? Then the next day, it's 25 cents. And as you see, that balance starts to grow where it starts to spiral out of control. That's why compound interest can be so damaging, uh, again, if it's working against you. All right, so the takeaway there is, this is just information, but when you go get a car loan, when you go get a home loan, or you know maybe your next uh, gas card or, or whatever you might be looking at, oftentimes they're gonna shove that APR in front of you because it's lower, right? It, an APR of maybe 4.5% might really have an annual percentage yield of 5%. So it does make a difference, and that's where the real, uh, pardon me, where the real number is. So <clears throat> we're about to step into emergency funds, and we're gonna talk about that. So now though, let's look at how interest can work for you, right? So what I'm about to suggest is uh, for your emergency fund, you should have a high yield account. And it's called a high yield account because you can actually get about 100 times more interest than you would from your traditional bank. And so here's what I mean by that. When I say traditional bank, I mean Bank of America, Chase Bank, um, you know, Wells Fargo. I'm going to call those all traditional banks where probably most of you have your uh, direct deposit going from your employer. And maybe you pay all your bills from there. And that's perfect. Keep doing that. Uh, no issues there. But when it comes to saving your long-term <clears throat> uh, emergency savings, you shouldn't necessarily be saving there. Why? Because they give you such an extremely low interest rate uh, that you're actually you're losing money. You're throwing it away. So what I'm going to recommend are one of two uh, accounts that I've used in the past. And you don't have to use these. You can find your own. But I've used Capital One 360, and it's called a performance savings. So Capital One 360 performance savings and uh, Synchrony high yield account. Those are two examples. And both of those right now, I think are paying about 1% interest. But anyway, so here's an example. If you have $1,000 and you're going to say that in your, your traditional bank, at the end of your year, you'll get about 10 cents in interest. But if you take that same $1,000 and you put that to your high yield account that I'm suggesting, they'll now at the end of the year pay you about $10, right? So you can have 10 cents or you can have $10, right? 100 times the interest. And I know that doesn't sound a lot, like a lot, but... What I'm about to suggest now, uh, as we move to the bottom of the screen, is have your emergency fund that has three to six months of your bills, right? And this is for larger uh, events in life. So 
uh, let's go back to that example earlier. Let's say your, your monthly bills are $2,000. And, and by the way, add up everything, right? What you spend on groceries, your car note, your insurance, your rent, uh, if you're a homeowner, your mortgage, taxes, everything, right? Um, add that up, whatever that number is. In this example, we'll say it's $2,000. Well, if I'm asking you to have a minimum of three months, then we're talking about $6,000. Some people are even more risk adverse and they, and they just, you know, hey, I'd rather have a little extra cushion. Maybe you should stretch closer to six months. Maybe it's five months, but I would recommend three at a minimum, right? Now you might say, well, why? You know, I thought we already talked about having a thousand dollars. I thought I was good with that, right? I got that in my traditional account. That way I can, I can fix a tire or I can go to the doctor and that's all good. Uh, but remember that is for having fluid money that you can take out today, right? If somebody called you and said, hey, you know, I need 50 bucks, such and such has to go to the doctor. That's what that's for. When we're talking about emergency funds for three to six months, it's for other things in life, right? Uh, maybe you want to start saving for a down payment for your own home, right? Maybe you want to buy your own house, right? A high yield account is a good place to save that. Maybe you're currently already a homeowner and, uh, you know, God forgive, <clears throat> pardon me, God forbid, but maybe uh, there's going to be a storm tomorrow, all right? And it's going to blow off your chimney or it's going to tear off half your roof. Uh, the deductible for that insurance claim itself might be three or $4,000. And then, of course, it's and this is all around us, unfortunately, we're in the midst of a pandemic, right? Who could have predicted this? But for the person that had three to six months of uh, savings built up of all their bills, they could at least know that, yeah, I got laid off, right? And it's March, but I have enough money to keep me afloat until September, right? If you got six months or maybe June, if I got three months. And while that might not get you out of this pandemic, right? This thing seems to keep dragging on and on. It is enough to at least give you that buffer where you can say, okay, I lost my job, right? Not, I'm not going to lose my mind. I'm not freaking out. I can still pay rent, right? My, my family can still have food to eat and there's, there's no worries there. And then maybe in between I'm picking up 10 hours to work, uh, right? 10 hours a week here, 15 hours there. Maybe I'm doing some deliveries or whatever, but it's enough where you can start. At least you have some breathing room, right? So, so it's not, um, the sky is not falling, right? All at once. So, Anyways, all right, so now you understand. Okay, that's why I'm asking for three to six months, or at least that's why I would suggest it. So then what do we do from here? What's the action? So here's your takeaway. You can, starting tonight, uh, you can take 10 minutes and you can open up one of these accounts. Again, feel free to go you know, search around. There's others that are out there. Uh, I personally am just comfortable with these two that I've mentioned. Uh, but you can open up a Capital One 360 Performance Savings in about 10 minutes. You can do it online, uh, right? We've all opened accounts. That's how you're here watching me live now. So you can open that account up. Once you open that account, though, I would then suggest a couple of other things. One, set up auto transfer five days, for example, after you get paid, right? So here I'm going to mention again, automate your savings in this case. Earlier, we talked about automating bills, and we're going to, we're going to touch on that again. But in this case, let's say you get paid on the 1st and the 15th. And uh, let's say you have direct, um, direct deposit from your employer that goes into your traditional account. Maybe that goes on the 1st and the 15th. I would say... Uh, set up an auto, uh, sorry, an automatic schedule. So on the fifth of the month and on the twentieth of the month, you're automatically pulling your savings over to your high yield account. This way, it's it's set it and forget it, right? I'd rather uh, you, by the way, establish a consistent savings than uh, worry about the amount. Right? I don't care if you if you can only save ten dollars every paycheck, then start there, right? If you can save a hundred dollars paycheck, great, start there. But the point is, do it consistently because it's going to establish a habit. And by the way, here's another good thing about having this high yield account. It actually takes about three days for you to move money to that account or back out of that account, back to your traditional. And I say that's good because uh, for some of you that might, you know, have a hard time holding on to money or, you know, you might be at the mall or you might, I don't know, maybe you're at Home Depot and you're looking at some new power tool. This is going to force you to slow down, right? You might say, oh, well, I really want that power tool and that's, that's $500, but I don't have it, right? I don't have it in my checking. I need to, I need to keep my checking where it is because my bills come out of there and I need to have that emergency funds, that extra 1000 that we talked about. So if you go to transfer this money from your high yield, it's going to take a few days, right? And that means it's a few days for you to really contemplate, do I really need that right now? Uh, maybe the answer is yes, and that's fine. But I think that's why it's a good idea. And so, by the way, I'm going to talk you through opening this account. Uh, you go online. Uh, obviously, you fill in your information. You, you hit open. And in a matter of minutes, you'll be able to actually log in there. Of course, save your password and everything else in a secure, in a secure place. But after that, you need to link your account that you just opened to your traditional account. And the way you do that is pretty simple. They're going to ask you for your routing number and your checking account number. You'll put that in and then they'll say, hey, in about three days, you're going to notice very uh, two small deposits into your account. Go see what those deposits are. Come back here and tell us, right? It's probably three cents or maybe seven cents. And once you verify that in three days, your account is linked, right? So now you can move money from your traditional account over to your high yield account. 
And now again, you can go set up that automatic transfer rule to start pulling that money uh, again in three to five, five days after you get paid. If your deposit is slowed down from your employer or whatever it might be, uh, figure out what works for you. But um, that's that's kind of the, the structure of that. And that's kind of how that works. Now, one other tip, a thing at least I would suggest is we're all going to get raises periodically. And when you get a raise, try to allocate 50% of that raise to your saving or your investing. Right. So maybe you get a dollar an hour raise, which means if you work 80 hours in two weeks, you get an extra $80 on your paycheck. So go back into your high yield account, modify that rule and add uh, $40, right? Half of that. And if you want to do more than that, feel free. But it's just a challenge for you to say, every time I start making more money, I should also increase my savings or my investing or paying off that that uh, high interest uh, credit that we we're talking about. Sorry, high interest debt that we were talking about. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of where we are. That's the end of this slide. Um, again, if we have any other questions, Quincy, let's go ahead and chat about those. Otherwise, we can keep it moving. So we did have a question. So we had earlier, we had this question from Jerry Stevenson. What advice would you give to someone who can't save $1,000 for an emergency fund if they are living paycheck to paycheck? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, right. Not everybody has the description pardon me, the discretionary income. And, and actually, uh, and I apologize, Jerry, thank you for asking that question. Uh, I actually meant to mention this on slide one, and that's fine, I'll, I'll mention it here now, which is this does need to start out with understanding the money that you make, cash in, the money that you spend, cash out, and what is left over, which is called your discretionary income, right? So your net take home pay, figure out your bills, and then see what's left over, right? And maybe to Jerry's point, maybe that's still not enough. And I'm actually going to touch on that in the very last slide because I'm going to recommend some ways that you can start to uh, improve your skill set, pick up some new skills at a very low cost rate, uh, sometimes free. And I'm also going to talk about other ways that we can save and eliminate fees so we can create a buffer. So maybe maybe today you're not saving anything, but at the end of this, just by eliminating some of the waste that we're going to talk about here in a bit, maybe we can free up $100 a month. Uh, so we'll get to that here in just a bit. So thank you, Jerry. And we had another question from April Vonner. Uh, any black owned banks offering high interest options? So one of the things that we focus on at 21 Days Black uh, Empowerment Challenge is how we can invest our funds back into black banks and black communities so that we bring uh, income and the ability for uh, banks to loan and lend and in you know to black businesses and, and black homeowners or aspiring homeowners so we have been um we are a part of the Bi uh, bank black movement um why, when she asked that question i did find something online pretty quickly uh this one particular bank in los angeles i'll show you that um so broadway federal bank uh has assets well not the assets but anyway they have a high yield interest checking 0.15% APY, 25,000 minimum to open monthly. So there, there are banks out there that are available, I'm assuming that just takes some research. Absolutely, I'm, I'm sure, at least I hope that there's, there's options out there, right? The two that I mentioned, again, those are 1.0 or 1.05 APY. So in this case, it's not to discredit this bank um, or anybody. Right? I'm just showing that comparison because we are talking about interest rates today. Uh, 0.15 versus 1.0, right? That's, you know, I can't do the math in my head, but that's probably a 7x difference. Uh, so, and also keep in mind, a couple of the banks I mentioned, and I'm, I'm, I chose these for a reason, there's actually no minimum balance and there's no fees to open it. So I do want to see people start to get in and start establishing good habits sooner than later. Because if there is a if there is a barrier like twenty five hundred dollars to even open that account, it's going to slow a lot of people down, right? So maybe start with one of the options I've suggested today, because you can get in there starting today. It costs nothing to open it. There's zero minimum balance. You can start building your money, and then once uh, maybe you're comfortable and you have twenty five hundred dollars, then maybe you can open up this account or something like that. And uh, yeah, maybe you'll sacrifice some of that interest and that yield, but maybe that's worth it. And I think it is in some cases too. Uh, sacrifice some bit of our money so we can start investing in some of these other black owned businesses and communities to help uh, all, all boats rise, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good point, April. I appreciate that question there. And Unfortunately, I don't have a on, on any black owned banks today offering um, that competitive rate that I mentioned, but um, I, to be honest, I haven't exhausted my, my searches either. 
Perfect. So I am going to. All right. Cool. So, um, yeah, so we just wrapped that up with a little more savings um, in taking some of your, your future raises and allocating maybe 50% if, if you don't want to do more. So uh, we're done with this slide. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. And so what we're going to talk about now is let's start building good habits. Right. And I say that because uh, we just covered a few of these and I really want to um, let's just kind of walk through them. Right. Wasting money, paying fees, right? And again, I want you to use auto pay. <laughs> again, you'll see auto pay your bills, auto pay your savings, auto pay your investing. We haven't yet talked to but but we'll get there at least in the future uh, series. But credit card interest, we talked about that, right? That was kind of step two for me. Step one, get that extra thousand dollars in your checking account. Step two, prioritize paying off that high uh, high interest debt. So that kind of talks to the first two, right? If you have that extra thousand dollars in your checking account, you shouldn't be getting hit with overdraft fees. But then the next piece is late payments, right? Because some of us might still be paying bills manually. I know it maybe uh, isn't isn't so comfortable for everybody, but I, I would urge everybody to start getting into using the technology that is made available to us. Right? We can auto transfer money from our traditional to our high yield account. We can pay all of our uh, vendors and our, our creditors on time if we use automatic bill payments. And you don't have to worry because I'm not suggesting that you don't stop looking at your bills. You should absolutely keep looking at those. In that way, if there's an error, you simply call the, the creditor, maybe it's a utility, maybe it's your, you know, whoever, your car insurance, and you still have, right, dispute that, have that conversation and say, hey, look, you know, normally this is $80, today it was 110, you know, what's going on there, right? They'll refund that. Um, so paying your bills automatically does not prevent you from, from uh, fixing any, any errors that come up. And also, if you think about that, for those people that are paying bills manually, you're probably spending a couple of hours a month, right? If you have eight creditors that you got, got a call or you're running around town or you're writing checks and sending that out, it's probably a couple of hours. So, excuse me, paying your bills automatically is also going to save you that time. And because of that, so now you're saving time, you're paying everything automatically. Now you're also doing yourself a favor with regards to your credit, right? Because if you are paying manually and you forget to pay something or you paid it late, maybe not only did you get hit with the fee, but that creditor may have now turned around and reported that to the uh, three agencies showing now that, you know, hey, Jane didn't make her payment on time, right? Or whoever it is, right? So now that's a bad mark on your credit. Uh, so there's multiple reasons, obviously, to automate everything here. Um, and then the last one is ATM fees, right? Sometimes we'll, we'll all be, you know, maybe running downtown or you're going to, to an event right before a pandemic and maybe you need to park and it's, you know, cash only. Uh, keep some money in your pocket. We'll talk about that here in a bit um, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, but that's one way to stop that, right? And, and then the last one here is forgotten subscriptions. So I think this is probably more common than people realize, right? I'm sure, for example, there's probably a lot of people that came to this pandemic and said, hey, this is a great time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try out this new you know, Peloton app. I'm going to lose some weight. And maybe you signed up for a two-week trial and you just totally forgot about it. And you're back on the couch watching Netflix, right? You're probably still paying them, right? If you forgot about it, maybe, uh, maybe you also had a gym membership, you know, and everything was uh, going, going well. And then we got to the pandemic. You can't use it, right? So simply look at that, right? You need to audit what you have going on. See if there's any payments out there, things that you're, uh, things that are still happening that you just totally forgot about. So this can cost you thousands of dollars a year, right? So we're not going to go into to, uh, all the things there because we previously covered those. But once you add these up, right, $80 a month interest, maybe a $35 overdraft fee, um, you, you know, you forgot about that subscription that's $10 a month. You know, maybe by the time you're, you're up to 100 bucks a month, that right there is 1200 bucks a year. Right, so that, that accounts for something. So what I'm gonna suggest, here's the action, is I used a free service. Uh, I have used and still continue to use a free service called mint.com. Um, what it does, you simply uh, sign up for Mint just like, like you would any other account. But what Mint does is you plug it into all of your accounts, meaning credit cards, checking accounts, savings accounts, your high yield account. And all it does is look, it sees everything that's happening. Right, so this way, if there's ever, um, I don't know, some some erroneous charge that comes through on a car or maybe some fraudulent charge, I can go to one single place, mint.com, and I can see every transaction. It's also nice because they start to track your spending and that way they can show you trends, right? They might say, hey, it looks like you, you know, you normally spend $300 a month in groceries, but this month you spent $400. You know, you might just be aware of that. Um, also, you can set budgets in there to say, I want to set up uh, an entertainment budget of, of $80 a month. And as you start getting close to that $80 for the month, it actually emails you and says, hey, look, you're at $70, your budget's 80, so you're coming up on that. So it can be useful to keep you in line. It can set goals, set budgets for all these things that we're talking about. 
but if nothing else, it aggregates all of your spending and all of your activity into a single portal. And now you can see everything and you can start fishing around for any of these subscriptions that you may have forgotten about. Um, so let's see, let's go ahead and let's see, let's go ahead and jump down and let's talk about this budget. All right. Do I really need a budget? All right. And if you're like me, uh, you hate the word budget, right? But it's hard to even have a personal, having a personal finance conversation without using that word at least once or twice. Uh, but quite frankly, I'm not a fan of budgets. I think they're tedious, right? Most people say, I got to watch what I spend, right? Uh, how much am I spending on going out? How much am I spending on dinners? What about lunches? Uh, what about, you know, wherever, right? Um, and that's a lot. So what I suggest personally, and this is what I do, is I actually flip that. So instead of watching what I spend, I simply watch what I save. And so you got to start with this exercise. And again, apologies for skipping this in slide one, but you got to know how much money you're bringing home, your cash in. You got to know how much money you're spending on your bills, your cash out, and then what is left. Again, that discretionary income. And let's just say you got $300 a month left. At that point, you need to think up to yourself, well, what do I want to do? do with that 300 do i want to save 100 of that off that uh not high interest debt and that's great but you need to figure out a piece of that discretionary income discretionary income pardon me and figure out what you want to do with it so if you for example say i want to simply save 100 dollars a month and i'm going to put that to my high yield account you need to go back to your high yield account and just do what we talked about earlier edit that automatic savings rule and maybe say every two weeks right once you get paid move 50 dollars. do that twice a month you're saving 100 bucks and so at that point, you've done what some people say is called paying yourself first. If you've ever heard that term, you're treating your savings just like you would a bill, right? You get paid, like I said, cash in and then you right, pay all your bills, your insurance, your car note and everything else. But now you're also paying yourself next, right? You, you establish that monthly savings that goes into your account and now you simply spend the rest. So it's much easier to manage and track as long as you are doing it this way. Instead of watching everything that you spend, you just watch what you save and make sure that you do that. And let's see, um, here's another tip for some of you that maybe aren't yet so good with managing credit cards or even debit cards, right? Because it's so easy to swipe. Uh, in the credit card companies, they all know this. It's very easy for us to go to the store, swipe a card, and it's you know magically paid for. Uh, there's something different about when you have to pay in cash, right? Because you're physically letting go of that money. And so for those of you that are still dealing with the, the credit card debt and we need to pay that off, the other thing I would suggest is once you get paid, go to your bank, get that cash and put that in an envelope. And now and still remember, pay yourself first. Right. So have that have that money go to your debt or have it go to your savings. But now whatever's in that envelope, that's all you can spend. And just tell yourself once this is gone. Right. I'm not you know, I can't go back to the bank. I need to wait until my next paycheck. Simple as that. Uh, so get that cash, put an envelope, maybe put it in your drawer, put it in a safe place. Right. And keep a little bit in your wallet. Right. So that that way, when you do have to pay for something in cash, you have that there and you're not looking for an ATM to, to uh, get hit with more fees. Right. Or blow your budget. Um, so anyway, so go home, figure that out. All right. Cash in, cash out. What do I have left? What do I need to do with that and automate it? Uh, so that's all we have on this slide. Uh, any other questions here? All right. So I believe we, we actually have, um, let me see, um, we had a couple of comments. Okay, there we go. No questions per se. We did have a comment from April Vonner. I was charged $15 because I moved money from one account to another, actually the same account, but the different type account of account. I called and had a talk. A talk. She had a talk <laughs> with oh, yeah. the with the lady. <laughs> um, but Crystal said earlier. Um, I think we were, she was probably referring to uh, the black banks and having high yield. I feel you. They would be better equipped to compete with the big guys if more people opened accounts with them. Absolutely. I agree with that. And, and that's why I said I am an advocate of still investing in black businesses. Uh, but for the sake of just getting people into building those habits right now, um, then it's going to make it challenging, especially when there's a twenty five hundred dollar you know minimum just to get in there. Right. Because to Jerry's point, what if we don't have a thousand dollars right laying around? Uh, so these take, you know, it's baby steps. Right. Start mm -hmm. with what we can start with the accounts that have no no fees, no minimums, uh, no hurdles. 
Let's start establishing that. And then let's start redirecting our money to some of these black owned businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. And that way. Yeah. Can compete. And in our program, I can't recall exactly what day of the 21 days, if Jerry is watching, um, we actually have some uh, options, some tasks, some things that people can do, can use to make some um, secondary cash, some extra cash on top of their jobs without having um, to have a full time side gig. So it's just some easy ways to bring in some little extra cash that you can put aside until you, like you said, a little bit at a time, um, you know, uh, gain the amount that you need. Um, I think we have one more question and then we'll move on to your next slide. Okay. Oh, uh, did you see Jerry's question was, what do you think about the envelope system? So I think, and I see some comments there. It looks like Robbie, uh, thanks Robbie for joining. It looks like she says, hey, envelopes work. Uh, but to April's point, envelopes work if you let them, right? We, we all got to have this self-discipline. And a lot of things, what I'm talking about is a lot of tactical, right, concrete steps that we can go do. Uh, but I can't necessarily correct everybody's behavioral problems, right? <laughs> some of us have spending problems. We have these urges. And I think uh, that's what I'm trying to address, at least with that envelope, to say, if it's not in this envelope, if this thing is empty, there's there's nothing else I can do here, right? And I I personally, or you personally, would have to have that discipline to say, "Well, I get paid in three days. I guess I'm, I guess I'm taking leftovers to work for the next three days," and that's just the way it is. Um, if if you go back to those old ways, uh, the things that we're talking about today aren't necessarily going to help you. Um, so again, Robbie, thanks for uh, thanks for seconding that that envelope in uh, in April. Yeah, it's gotta it's gotta be up to us to make it work. Okay, so let's see. So beyond building good habits, let's go ahead and proceed to the next screen, and let's talk about assets versus liabilities. All right, so uh, these are sort of two sides of the same coin, and, and we're gonna see that here in just a minute, but uh, liabilities, I, I'm gonna try to keep these definitions simple. Liabilities simply, they take money out of your pocket, right? Uh, they do not produce income. So think to yourself, cars, jewelry, clothing, things like that, right? We all like to look good, I get it. I mean, yeah, I'm wearing a watch right now. Um, hopefully, and it actually, here's a, here's a comment or something that I at least have told my kids. You can have anything, but you can't have everything, right? So yeah, get you a watch, get you get you a nice pair of shoes or the thing that you've been looking at for a while. We all got to treat ourselves, right? Um, I'm not advocating that we deprive ourselves of, of life's niceties, right? And employment fund fund and things like that, but uh, we still got to be smart about it, right? So thinking about liabilities again, they take money out of your pocket and they do not produce income. Assets, on the other hand, they do put money in your pocket, right? And they have monetary value. Uh, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, my, my watch or my, my jewelry has monetary value. And that's absolutely true. It does, but it still does not produce income. So uh, let's look at what does produce income, right? So I've got 401ks, IRAs, and essentially what those are, retirement accounts. Uh, 401ks and IRAs, by the way, I'm going to go into that in my next uh, live stream, which might be in a week or two out. We'll get that figured out. Uh, but we're going to take a deep dive into that, right? We're going to talk about 401ks, IRAs, which, by the way, stands for individual retirement accounts. Uh, we'll talk about stocks, bonds, uh, asset classes, mutual funds, S&P 500, all kinds of uh, hopefully useful stuff because, and I think this is important because I don't know the stat on this, but the, a large majority of employers offer 401ks and it's a way for you to access the stock market and start investing, right? And that is the difference between saving and investing. You're starting to put those dollars to work. Um, so anyways, um, sorry, I probably went a little further on that than I need to, but 401ks and IRAs, that is a way for you to invest money and that returns you money. So that puts money back in your pocket. Same with real estate, right? Um, and not necessarily if you buy your own home and you live in it, that's good um, because that can give you an appreciation and, and, you know, generally real estate tends to increase in time, right? Maybe you bought something for $200,000, but in five years, maybe it's worth 210, right? In 20 years, maybe it's worth 250. Uh, that's not always the case, but it is very common for real estate to appreciate. But if we are talking about rental real estate, for example, uh, obviously, if you buy something and you keep tenants in there and they're paying a thousand bucks a month or whatever it is for that market, then that's that's money back to you. Right. At some point in the future, that real estate will be paid off. You will own that property free and clear. And now everything that those tenants are paying is actually supporting your lifestyle. Right. That is income. Uh, the next up, I mentioned business equipment because that is a way for you, a business in general is a way for you to put money into your pocket, obviously. So, uh, but I want to use this as an example, right? Maybe some of you out there might be, for example, a uh, photography enthusiast, right? And you might say, well, I want to go get this Nikon camera for $3,000. And there's, you know, there's a nice lens on it for an extra $3,000 and that's $6,000 all in. 
and maybe you just like to do pictures, uh, you can probably take decent pictures without spending $6,000. However, if your business is photography, at some point in the future, one, not only uh, is that equipment a write-off, but two, uh, let's just say you spend that $6,000 and let's say your average photo shoot is 600 bucks. Well, after 10 photo shoots, you got your $6,000 back, right? Everything after that is going to be income in your pocket. And again, that's a business, right? So that's what's different. So uh, yeah, as a camera, can that be uh, classified as a liability? Absolutely. Um, just like some other things as well. But just ask yourself, does it put money in your pocket or does it take money away from you, right? Um, and especially cars. I'm going to hop back to liabilities. When I talk about cars, right, oftentimes people drive, uh, sorry, will buy a brand new car. Generally in the first year, that car depreciates about 25%, right? So if you buy a $20,000 car, at the end of year one, it's worth $15,000, which is why a lot of people say, even if you got to buy a, a new-ish car, get, get one that's used. Maybe it's one year old, right? But you've already let the original owner take the hit. Uh, but still, a car's liability is taking money out of your pocket. It's maintenance, repairs, things of that nature. Um, in the last, though, I'm going to hop back over to assets. Uh, the last one there on that bullet point is cash. And ultimately, with cash, we already talked about our high yield account. If you put $1,000 in your high yield account, it's going to give you $10 at the end of the year, roughly, right, with 1% uh, returns. But for people that also have cash, they can also do just like a bank does, right? They can be a, a lender, right? So there's private lenders. There's hard money lenders. Uh, you know, maybe I want to do a real estate deal and I need $80,000. And maybe you have $20,000. You say, hey. You know, maybe I'll say, hey, Adrian, I'll loan you this $20,000. That way I can go do my, my fix and flip, right? Get a house, repair it, um, sell it. That way I make some money, but now I'm giving you interest on your money, all right? Maybe I owe you 10% on the $20,000 that you loaned me for six months. But anyways, it's just a point to say that cash itself can also be an asset if it's employed the right way, right? So we talk about uh, putting our, our money to work for us. Uh, so anyway, so hopefully all this makes sense, right? Retirement accounts, real estate, business equipment, uh, all of that stuff can make you money if you know how to use it. All right, so now that we've defined those, we can talk a little bit about net worth. And so uh, with net worth, it's simply your, you know, the difference between your assets and your liabilities. So, um, and by the way, I like to tell everybody, think about your net worth as your scorecard. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. Uh, in fact, we can probably go ahead and go to the next slide now. Think about your net worth as your scorecard, right? If it is negative, meaning you have more liabilities and you have assets, you need to figure out a way to turn that around. And you might say, well, why is this important? Um, it's important for a couple of reasons. One, right now, all of us, or probably all of us, we're trading our time for money, right? You go to work, maybe you work for 80 hours, and they give you a paycheck. At some point, we're all going to have to stop working, right? Maybe our bodies break down. Maybe we're not as mobile as we used to be. Uh, maybe we work in factories or, or we work outside in extreme conditions where it's hot or it's extremely cold. Uh, we're going to break down, right? So. What I'm trying to get you to do is stop thinking about uh, making money by trading your time, right? So stop trading your time for money. And the way you do that is by buying assets and stop buying liabilities, right? And so uh, here's a phrase a lot of us probably heard growing up. Money doesn't grow on trees. Well, I say it does if you create a money tree. And that's what assets are. They are a money tree, right? That rental property where you have tenants, they're paying you, it's producing money. Uh, so think about it like that. Start buying assets, less of liabilities, and start to shift your your mind frame. Um, so with that slide that was just up. Uh, so like been... before you move on, um, we had yeah. uh, we actually had one question uh, about mm -hmm. um, from the last sec segment. So it is from Michael McClinton. Starting out, should I start a regular IRA account or a self directed account? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's probably better suited for our next discussion, but but uh, to give you at least a piece of an answer to help you think about it. Uh, so to, sell, to start a self-directed account versus an IRA, all right? Uh, so again, sorry, some quick advanced topics. IRA is an individual retirement account. Anybody that has a job can go open an IRA, right? So I can go to fidelity.com or you know Vanguard. Those are the two I, I put up there. I like Fidelity personally. Uh, you can go right now to Fidelity. You can say, open an account, fill in your information, and you'll have an account open in five or 10 minutes. At that point, you can take your money, and, and there's tax consequences in here, obviously, uh, but you can invest some money into the stock market, stocks, bonds, or mutual funds, right? And a mutual fund is like a basket of companies. So you put in a dollar and you're spreading that amongst a whole lot of companies. So yes, you can do that. Now, to address your uh, self-directed IRA, SDIRA, a reason why people might do that, and by the way, it's not common. Most people probably don't even know about self-directed IRAs. It's because uh, self-directed means 
you can take your money that is in your self-directed IRA and you can invest that into non-common right, or atypical investments. Um, maybe you know about horses and horse racing, right? You can actually acquire assets like uh, horses, for example, or real estate, um, and you can put that into that account. And by the way, people, when we say 401ks and IRAs, I always like to say, think of these just like jars of money, right? It's just a place where you put money, but they all have different rules on the jar. So if you think about a savings account, you know, you can put money in that savings account, but maybe the rule is you have to go into the bank to get your money or to put money in. But if you have a checking account, let's say you have a checkbook, that's a rule. Another rule is you get an ATM card and you can also go into the bank. So now when we talk about self-directed IRAs and uh, IRAs themselves, those are two separate jars, just like the ones that we previously talked about, but they have different rules on them. Some of those rules are that you can't uh, take the money out before 59 and a half years old, otherwise you'll get a 10% penalty. Then uh, there's a lot of other rules. And this is exactly what we're gonna talk about in the next session that I'll be doing. Uh, we're gonna break down IRAs versus 401ks in traditional and Roth and what that means. Uh, so thank you for the question. Now I might even have to think about self-directed, but I guess to answer that for you is I personally, and probably for the majority of people in IRA, um, I really like Roth, by the way. Uh, those are probably good investment types, but again, join me in the next session. I'll be happy to dig in that a little bit further and, and that'll be a helpful question for us all to explore together. So, <clears throat> Sorry, to leave, sorry if I left you hanging, uh, but let's go ahead and pop back over to the other slide where we were, and that's going to show us our net worth. All right, so with this slide, calculating your net worth. Uh, again, net worth is the difference between your assets and your liabilities. So on the left here, uh, and sorry, it's an ugly spreadsheet, but you know I, I've done this in about five minutes, and it's just a simple illustration. Assets here on the left are things that you own or have value. So maybe you have a car and it's uh, maybe it's a used car and it's worth fifteen thousand dollars. Maybe your second car is worth five thousand dollars. Maybe it's a bit older. Uh, but if you look on the right, car one, for example, maybe you still owe ten thousand dollars on it. Right, you're still paying that. Uh, oh, I have car one twice. Uh, the second row down on the liability side is also it's supposed to be car two, but maybe that's paid off. Right. So uh, now you'll start to see the. The, uh, I guess juxt uh, yeah, to juxtapose the two, right? Your, your assets versus your liabilities, right? Uh, money and things that you own versus money that you owe to people uh, or for some of these things that you've acquired. And so if you look at home equity, let's talk about this for a moment. Let's say that you bought a home for $200,000 and maybe by the, you know, you're 20, you got it halfway paid off or you're 15, wherever, whatever the math looks like. So now you got $100,000. And by the way, I always tell everybody, think about a home, owning your home as, as a big piggy bank. Every time you're making that money, uh, sorry, making that payment for your mortgage, it's just like dropping those coins in. So if you picture this one, in this case, our, our bank is halfway full, right? We paid off half of our house. That is your money and that's called equity, right? The amount that you own within your home. But now if you look on the right side, we still owe $100,000 in this example. Um, so anyway, so the short of it is add up everything in your assets, that's $150,000. Add up everything uh, that you still owe, here are our liabilities, and that's minus $110,000. So our net worth, of course, is the difference between those. So 150,000 minus 110,000 leaves us with the 40,000 in net worth. Now, a lot of people, a lot of black and brown communities, we don't always own a lot of assets. We have more liabilities, right? Liabilities, taking money away from us, draining us, right? So if you are negative, and you, this is an exercise, right? This is an action I'd like everybody to do. Go add up everything, see what that, see what that value is, see how much equity you have, see how much liabilities you have. And if you're negative, Really got to start thinking about turning that around. All right, so next slide, please. So what we're about to look at here on the next slide is uh, the median net worth. And the median net worth, by the way, median, let me explain that. Um, the slide is going to catch up here in a moment. Oftentimes we hear the word average and we hear the word median. Average, I'm going to give you an example. Maybe you have 10 people. Nine of them have zero dollars in income, right? They don't have jobs. But one individual has uh, $1 million. So you could say their average is $100,000 a person, but obviously that's not realistic. It's not indicative of the real situation. So median, which is what this graph shows, is uh, we'll use that same 10 people. Uh, maybe the first person is extreme poverty. Maybe the last person is still a millionaire and has extreme wealth. Excuse me, the individuals in between, right, the other eight, they might have more realistic incomes like $35,000 a year, 38, 38, maybe there's a 40, maybe there's two or three people with 40,000. And so when you line those up, the median is actually saying, here's the people, it's more representative 
of, of this population, of this sample of 10 people that we're talking about. And that's what this is. And I think that's important to understand because this is, is a realistic uh, depiction of where we are, right? And so if you look at, uh, let's just look at the uh, 2016, looking at that year, obviously this is a few years old, four years old, but $20,000 for black families and Hispanic families are just above that, all right? But having $20,000 versus jumping up to what white families make, and that is a, is a major difference. It's right, twenty thousand versus one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Right, that's over. A, it's it's an eight point five x gap, which is absolutely huge. And another way to think of that is just to say, you know, for every dollar a black family has, a white family has eight and a half dollars. Right, so uh, it's it's a big gap. Right, it's there and it's and it's real. Um, I, honestly, I didn't I didn't even boil the ocean. I didn't put in a lot of effort to go find these stats. Right, a quick Google search, you, you know, read through one or two, and you'll see that it's pretty eye opening. Uh, so anyway, so we can go ahead and proceed to the next. Uh, to the next slide here. And this is uh, on the next one is actually going to show us our median net worth by age. And this just kind of uh, paints it in a slightly different picture. And once uh, the slide catches up here, we'll see that starting with 18 to 34 year olds, which is on the far left side, there is um, a head start of about $25,000 for, for white families in this area. I'm going to give this just a moment. Seems like there's a delay here. So anyways, um, 18 to 34 year olds, there's a head start of about $25,000. And one thing I want to point out here is you can level this out, right? I'm saying this because we are here today to learn about financial education. Hopefully you'll start making different decisions, start shifting your thinking from liabilities to assets. And now by the time you buy a home or you start investing right in your retirement accounts, even if you don't use and, and uh, deplete those resources, right? Your, your house is something that generally will be maintained as long as you keep it up, right? Do the repairs. That is something you can hand down, right? To your children or to your niece or your nephew or whoever it might be. And giving somebody that much of a head start is, is huge, right? A house can be $250,000. On average, the US American house average is $250,000. So being able to hand something like that down, uh, yeah, you can level the playing field, right? You can give others after you a, a chance to um, have a good quality of life and not be in debt, right? But it's important you also got to share the knowledge, right? You can't hand somebody a whole lot of uh, money or, or assets and expect that they're going to know what to do with it. Because again, this stuff isn't taught, um, right? Unless you teach it at your dinner table. So uh, still, let's focus on the graph now. Let's look from the 18 and 34, right? Where there's a slight gap there. Maybe the, uh, looks like the white family maybe starts out um, around $25,000. But if you look up to the 35 to 44 bracket, it widens. It actually goes up, right? So that goes from about uh, maybe ten thousand dollars all the way up to a hundred thousand dollars for individuals uh, that are white uh, in that category. So uh, again, gap has grown. Now, if you fast forward and you look towards the end, there it's kind of leveled out, but it's still six x. Even by the time somebody gets to sixty five years to seventy five years of age, the gap is still six x, right? It's it's fifty thousand dollars versus three hundred thousand uh, dollars, and again, that's major. Uh, so, anyways, let's go ahead and move beyond this slide and let's take any questions if there are any. And after this, we're going to talk about major contributors of wealth um, in a couple of other slides here. So it looks like we have a pretty long delay. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and pick back up and we'll see if Quincy has any questions. Um, so a major contributor of net worth, home ownership, and, and I think Roth IRAs uh, are, are good choices. Um, home ownership, that's because we have the ability for that home to appreciate over time. And also because of mortgage versus rent. I think oftentimes you'll see that mortgage and rent is very close uh, to each other. They're, they're neck and neck. However, of course, if you do own your home, there's going to be things like lawn maintenance and repairs and major issues. Um, maybe an AC goes out and that's a few thousand dollars. So you absolutely have to keep that into account and take that into account. So um, I don't think we have any more comments or uh, questions. At least it doesn't seem to have refreshed. Um, so you can carry on. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's see, let's see where the slide that here. Uh, yeah, so major contributors in net worth. So yeah, I, I do think that home ownership is a is a good way to establish starting to build net worth, as well as Roth IRAs. Uh, so again, I talked about appreciation, and um, still, so you got to take these things into account everybody's situation is different but if you think about it like let's just say that a person pays a thousand dollars a month in rent 
Well, that means it's twelve thousand dollars a year, and over ten years, that's one hundred twenty thousand dollars. And let's, let's look at that over thirty years. That's three hundred sixty thousand uh, dollars for somebody paying rent. Now, that's assuming, of course, that rents don't go up, which that's a poor assumption. We know they will. Uh, but just as an example, three hundred sixty k renting. And if you look at somebody and they buy their home for about the same amount, and maybe they're going to have to spend an extra couple of thousand dollars a year uh, for repairs. Over 30 years, that's going to be about $420,000, right? It's just kind of a, this is kind of a very quick mental exercise, right? 360000 versus four hundred twenty, And at the end of it, right, you own something in that nest egg, that home, maybe you bought it and it was worth two fifty, dollars but maybe over 30 years, your area may have appreciated an amount, maybe it's worth $350,000. So that's that appreciation and that's the uh, building equity, right? Uh, filling up that piggy bank and having something at the end of it. Um, again, people have to figure it out. Not everybody's a big believer in, in home ownership. Uh, personally, I, I think it's good for, for probably a lot of people, but folks have to figure that out. Um, okay, so again, why is this important? Well, if nothing else, you can start to build generational wealth, hand that down. Um, so here, I want to mention something really fast. With regards to home ownership, I just want to show how easy uh, it can be. There are loans out there that you can get uh, for as low as 3.5% down, right? So for a $250,000 home, that would be about $9,000 down. And a person could save for a couple of years, right? Some of you probably have maybe sizable tax uh, tax returns, maybe 4,000, 5,000. Uh, but if you save that tax return, you can continue to save throughout the year after you pay down that, that high interest debt, you can have enough to go buy yourself, you and your family a home and start getting on that path if that's, you know, if that's uh, interesting to you, you think that that would work for you. Uh, so with that emergency savings, maybe you'll get your three to six months of emergency savings that we talked about. Just keep going, right? Continue to save. And maybe your next goal is home ownership. So uh, moving on from this topic, I want to talk about picking up new skills, right, to earn income. Because we've spent a lot of time and we've talked about eliminating waste, right? Interest fees, overdraft, um, all the other fees that we've talked about, right? Forgotten uh, subscriptions. So yeah, you can and you should eliminate that, right? Because that's just starting to build good habits. So even after you do that, some of you might say, well, if I save myself, uh, maybe I take lunch a few times to work, or maybe I stop getting that coffee on the way to work. Uh, yeah, maybe that gets you an extra $500 a year savings or an extra $1,000 a year. But again, I, I don't know how, how long can we keep that up, right? Again, depriving ourselves of, of life's uh, little enjoyment. So I'm not suggesting that. Instead, I would suggest start to learn something new, right? And I think this goes to Jerry's question, uh, you know, 30, 45 minutes ago, which is what if somebody doesn't have enough money at the uh, end of their paycheck, right? You get paid, you pay your bills and your discretionary income, maybe it's zero. Maybe you have just enough and you really are living paycheck to paycheck. So this is where education comes in. And I'm sharing these two resources that that we uh, found, right? I found edX a couple of years back, um, edx.org. It has over 2,500 courses. Right. A lot of these are free to audit, which means you can simply sign up and take the class. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, you can submit your homework if you want. It gets graded, but there's no pass or fail. Right. You're just there to, to watch. You're just there to audit. And I should say more than watch. Right. You're participating. You're watching the videos. You're doing the, the homework. Uh, but that's free. Now, there is an option where a lot of these courses you can pay, for example, seventy five dollars. If you pay and you pass the course, you then get a certificate and you can put that on your resume. You can put that on LinkedIn. And it says, hey, I passed this course, right? I took computer science at, at Harvard X uh, and I passed, right? Put that on your resume. And there's so many, again, there's 2,500 courses, but they're they're from elite schools, Harvard X, MIT, Hong Kong University, uh, University of Texas. So a lot of, a lot of uh, global institutions, a lot of, um, cor again, tons of courses, right? Uh, I've seen computer science, if you wanna learn to code, if you wanna learn about Chinese culture, if you're just interested in learning more about wines in, in France, uh, there's so much stuff that's out there and it's it's a lot of it is free. Um, the second one that, that me and my wife recently found and kind of stumbled upon is University of the People, right? And that's the second URL, www.uopeople.com, which is funny because I don't want y'all to owe anything, but University of the People is a uh, university that you can go to, it's online, and uh, they have degrees in, in these four that I've listed, which is business, health, computer science and education. Uh, these are the rough prices for your associate's ma uh, master's, if you want, and, and a bachelor's degree. Um, very affordable. Um, I personally, you know, $30,000 for an undergrad for a four-year degree. I'd much rather found this and spent $4,000, right? It's, it's like an eighth of the price. Uh, so I think there's some, some great opportunities here, and I'd really urge everybody to, one, check them out, try to pick up a new skill, share this with your family, share this with whoever you can, and organizations, NAACP, if any of you are members, 
um, just share this with where you can, because education really is the foundation, I think, of, of all this. And right, and that's exactly what I'm doing today is, is just sharing education. Uh, without knowing more, right, we can't do better. Um, so I think this is important. And just to go back to the example where I started here, which is, yeah, you can save yourself $30 a month in, uh, sorry, a week if you if you take your food to the office and maybe you shave off a drink here or a coffee there or whatever it might be. If instead you increased your earnings by $1 an hour, right, that itself is about $2,000 a year, right? So there's the difference, right? You can, you can starve yourself of all these little things and uh, save maybe a thousand dollars, or you can go study something, right? Learn it in six weeks, put that on your resume, and then maybe you get a new job, or maybe you go to your your current boss and say, "Hey, look, this is what I've learned," uh, right? And, and promote yourself, right? Go for that raise, and I think that's valuable. And I think there's more value here because there's unlimited potential, there's unlimited upside, anything that you learn, and you can parlay that into an increased salary and better quality of life. So uh, let's go ahead and move on from here. Let me check time. Looks like it's eight twelve. And um, if we have a little bit of time left, which I think we do, I'll cover this final section if there's another questions. So I'm gonna jump and just kind of keep going. Uh, Quincy, I'll let you interrupt me since there are some delays here. Uh, so let's talk about cleaning up your credit. And we'll see when the slide catches up. Uh, so cleaning up your credit and buying assets, right? Uh, so again, forget about liabilities. And I know we're all gonna buy some little things here and there, but assets should be the focus. Think about your net worth, that's your scorecard. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, oftentimes we're going to need credit. And so I want to talk about uh, a few a few things here. And by the way, this is the last topic. I know I've covered a lot here. So why is it important? Well, because one day you'll need to buy a new car. Uh, and by new car, I mean a slightly used car. Uh, but you'll want to do that or you'll need to buy a house or want to buy your house, uh, which is a good thing. Or maybe you'll, you'll need to furnish that uh, house as well. And you don't want to go buy a bunch of couches and, and uh, different furniture and cash. Right. So having your credit is important. And there's three types, by the way. So there's revolving credit. And revolving credit are simply like credit cards or gas cards, right? They call it revolving, almost like a revolving door. Uh, you know, you use a little bit of money, you pay it off to zero. You lose, use a little bit, you pay it back off to zero. So that's revolving. And installment, uh, installment credit is simply like a car loan, right? Maybe you start off with $8,000 and you pay that down, seven, six, five, four, all the way down to zero, right? You're making fixed monthly installments, 200 bucks a month or whatever it is um, until it's paid off in full. And then the last type are your open accounts. Uh, these are like utilities, right? Uh, with, with utilities, you use them and then you pay for them in arrears, right? You use electricity for the month and then you pay your electrical company. Um, and that's what that's what open accounts are. So when it comes to credit, there's a few different factors. Uh, and the biggest two are your payment history and the amount of credit that you use at any given time. So starting with payment history, uh, probably as simple as it sounds, are you making on-time payments, right, for your car loan? right? Every month, did you make a good payment in January, February, all the way through to December? And if you did, you'll have 12 good marks of uh, credit payments on there. And then and as for the amount owed, that simply means if you, for example, have a $900 credit card limit, how much of that $900 are you using? So the advice here is never use more than one third. And, you know, if you get a $3,000 credit limit, still don't use more than a third, which in that case would be $1,000. Right for a $900 card is $300. Um, so those are the two biggest ones. That probably accounts for about 60% of the weight of you know payment history and amount as it as it pertains to your credit. Uh, there's also credit length, meaning how long do you have credit? Maybe you, maybe you go back 15 years and you've had nothing but solid payments for 15 years, and that accounts for something as well. Um, and then last is maybe like new credit. Are you taking out new credit to to get a new uh, get a new vehicle or or something else? Uh, so what's the action on this one? The action here is. Go get your free credit report. Um, uh, I, I failed to to take my notes here. Uh, I think it's like annual free credit report. Just Google it. You know, uh, free credit report. Oftentimes you're out there, and I think you can probably even get them from Experian, uh, TransUnion, or Equifax. Those are the three uh, big you know credit reporting agencies. Uh, so you should be able to find that pretty easily. Sorry for not having uh, more information on that one. And so here's my tip. Right earlier, much earlier, we talked about credit cards, paying those off to zero, and again. For people that aren't good with credit, this is where the envelope comes in. Use it if you can. Uh, for the people that are, are, are actually good with managing their, their debit card and keeping their balances and paying off every single credit card to zero every single month, if you're good with that, you should consider uh, simply using credit cards, for example, cash back. Or, you know, we have a cash back credit card and I try to put everything on it, but I pay everything off in full every single month. And the same is, is what you should be going for, right? And if you can do that, you can actually use these credit cards to your advantage. 
Some people get travel rewards. Um, I simply like the cash back. And, uh, and here's another tip, by the way. If you can't afford to buy something in cash, don't put it on your credit card, right? Uh, because that's where you're going to start to get in trouble. So again, if you're in that spot, simply put on your Netflix or put on your insurance, car insurance or, or your car note. If you put those on different cards, then you're great, right? Use the things that you know you have to pay for. Put those on your cards. Put those cards in your drawer. Forget about them. And just know that you're still building that good credit history because you at least have one payment on each one of those cards. Um, so anyway, so moving on couple of tips. Uh, we already talked about not using more than a third of your credit. And um, something I've done uh, over the years is every every new year, right, January 2nd, right, everything's closed on January 1st. January 2nd, I get my credit cards, I call them, question increase. And this is good simply because it it reduces that that uh, debt ratio to how much um, credit is on a card, right? If you got that card for 900 bucks, you can't use more than 300. Um, but if you increase that, maybe up to $2,000, still don't use more than a third, but now that reduces your total use credit overall. And that, that looks good, right? Because maybe instead of using 10% credit, now uh, you're only using maybe 3%, right? So drive that number down and that, that looks good. Um, here's another tip for anybody that may have been, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, sorry, fraud. If you want to prevent fraud, you can actually call up or, and I think you can also do this online. You can freeze those cards and that's useful. That way you can, and I think that I'm uh, it took like five minutes last time, right? I called, I think it was an automated, uh, you know, robot on the other side and a answered a few questions. And then she placed a uh, credit freeze on all of my cards. And that way a person cannot then go and take out a loan in your name because your credit is locked. Uh, so anyways, that's just a tip for anybody that is extra conscious of, of uh, security and wanting to make sure that they, they keep their credit in good standing. Um, you can do that. And obviously you'd have to go and take that off or turn that credit freeze off whenever you do want to go get credit for, for whatever it might be. So uh, one more action here. For some of you, maybe you're saying, well, look, I'm already in a bad spot, meaning I have bad credit, and I need to get back in the good graces, right, of, of uh, the, the U.S. economy, and I need to get some credit so I can start making some of these moves and getting ahead and thinking about buying assets. So one of the things that I've done quite some time ago is I got a secured loan, right? Uh, I, was, I was, you know, 17, 18 years old once and, and screwed up my credit. And in order for me to, to get that going again, I went to a credit union. I said, hey, I'd like to open up a secure loan. And they said, sure, here's how it goes. Give us $1,000, which I did. They open up a loan for $1,000. And all I do is every thousand, I know it sounds, I'm sorry, every month, and I know this sounds silly, I made payments to pay off that secured loan, right? It's secured with my own money, but I'm paying that off. And once I do, right, $85 a month or whatever, get to the end of 12 months, you paid off the thousand bucks. Now you got 12 marks of good payments on your side, right? So that shows that's on your credit report and that starts to open up other opportunities. Maybe next you can go get a gas card or, or you know, again, a credit card if you feel like you're ready for that step and you can start getting some of that cash back that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so anyway, so that's, I think that's pretty much it. Um, oh, actually I do, I do mention, sorry. I do mention accounts and collection, right? Uh, my big disclaimer, this is not legal advice. I'm simply telling you what's worked for me. So I'm gonna talk you through a story um, and we'll, I'll point out a few a few things here. Uh, so first of all, when it comes to debt, there's something called the statute of limitations. And this is different for different types of debt. So uh, I just looked up mine this morning. I live here in Texas. Um, a creditor cannot come after a person. Well, they'll try unless you know this stuff. Uh, the statute of limitations here is four years. So, so as an example, let's just say four and a half years ago, I, uh, I wrote a check for anybody that still does that. I wrote a check and I, I bought some gas for 20 bucks. and you know, maybe the check bounced, right? Four years ago, four and a half years ago. Well, the creditor, maybe they, and, and I just kept ignoring them or didn't take their calls. And fast forward, and here we are four and a half years later. Now, maybe I get an angry letter and says, hey, uh, you know, you wrote this bad check. You owe us a thousand dollars. Okay, great. So here's, here's where knowing this can be beneficial. If I know that my statute of limitations is four years for a uh, credit card debt or a check that I wrote, what I can now do is simply there's ways to simply uh, prevent you from spending money that won't necessarily do you any good. And here's what I mean by that. Let's say that um, let's say that they want the $1,000. Well, I can simply say that, hey, I know in my state law that you cannot come after this debt. But here's how you do it. Let's say they call, right? You, you, get, a, you get a call from the collection agency. Hey, we demand you pay us this money. Step one, right? I never said that I even owe debt, right? And again, this is probably tricky territory, but I said, look, um, 
I don't know if I owe this, but let me get some information, right? Who's the vendor, right? Who did I write the check to? How much was it? When did I write it? Um, and what was the last payment, right? And then also uh, get the address of their agency so you can investigate this and you know write them a letter. And so with that, I was able to, knowing my state laws, and again, this is back in Kansas, different different laws, different time, but then I was able to use that to my advantage, right? And, and there is a way that I structured a letter simply saying, hey, look, I know my laws. Uh, the statute of limitations has passed. I don't owe this debt. Uh, this was not my debt. And I demand that you stop calling me. Don't write me any letters unless it's to say that is for further action. And I did that probably four or five times. Uh, out of that handful of times, everybody went away except for one individual, one lawyer. Um, he did come back and say, well, you know, uh, no, because of X, Y, and Z. And yeah, sure. I had to, I had to do that. Right. I had to pay that. Uh, but my point is here is that oftentimes there are late collections or accounts that are in very late collections. And just because you pay them, right, it can actually still stick around on your credit report. A lot of people think, well, I'm going to pay off this debt from five years ago and then it's going to go away. Actually, it's not. Oftentimes, even when you pay that, it still sticks around on your credit report for, you know, five to seven years. So you can actually kind of restart that credit cycle, that credit clock, and, and that can be a bad thing. Um, and again, even just paying it doesn't, you know, doesn't necessarily help you out. It doesn't necessarily benefit you. Um, it doesn't even mean it's going to drop off your credit report. Like I said, contrary to that, it can actually stick around on your credit report for longer. So that's kind of my spill there. Hopefully that helps. Maybe it's just, again, it's just knowledge. It's absolutely not legal advice, but it's simply, you should know that if there's old debt out there, there are statutes of limitations that can protect you and say, hey, look, sorry, it's too late. Too much time has lapsed. Um, you can't go after this person. And of course they'll try. And if you pay them, they'll gladly take that. But as long as you know that you have some recourse, uh, knowledge is on your side. Um, and then of course, for any, any uh, just a final point on this, for any creditors that I did speak with, negotiate. Um, I don't care if you just got a medical bill from, from two weeks ago. Um, you can call them up and say, hey, look, you know, there's challenging times right now. And I want to know, like, if I pay this in full, can you guys give me a discount? Can you take some of that money off? And oftentimes it will. It might take 20 percent off the top. Right. You got a thousand dollar medical bill it drops off 200 bucks. That counts for something. Um, so negotiate and use knowledge. Use your statute of limitations. Understand uh, how you can kind of navigate these systems when uh, when folks are trying to collect. Um, hopefully you get out of those situations. And you don't have to worry about that anymore. But again, I thought it was uh, at least noteworthy to, to kind of mention. So I think that is that is it here. So what we're going to do, we're coming up on time. Um, what we're going to do with the next two slides are nothing but actions, right? And uh, Quincy, if we have any questions, we'll go ahead and take those now. But this aside, we're going to look at the two slides and we're just going to talk to those real briefly because that's what all of you should do to start to put these in place if you think that they're good for you. All right, so let's see what we got. <clears throat> so for the first slide with actions, and I'll again just let Quincy interrupt me whenever he's ready. For the first slide of actions, we are going to, one, look at our pay stub, figure out our take-home amount, add up your bills, and figure out how much is left over. After that, the next goal is to keep that extra $1,000 in your checking account to prevent you from using credit cards, right, high-interest debt. Pay that off as soon as possible. Again, financial quicksand, if you're not good with it, it can take you down, it can keep you down, right? Pay those credit cards to zero, set them up on auto pay, and then maybe put a bill on them and put that put that credit card in the drawer. Uh, next up, I would suggest opening up a high yield account. Again, I've used Capital One Performance, uh, sorry, Capital One 360 Performance Savings, and I've also used Security High Yield. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, there potentially are other banks out there, maybe some black owned banks as well, uh, that offer uh, I guess competitive rates and also might be a good, sorry, a good place to uh, to put your money. Um, once you open that high yield account, you want to set up, well, one, make sure you have direct deposit of your employer's paycheck to your traditional account. But then once you have your high yield account set up, you want to automate savings. So you are paying yourself first. So after that, let's go ahead and go to the second slide of actions. And with that, we're going to, uh, actually, I just mentioned this one, set up automatic transfer from your checking to your high yield, right? Pay yourself first. Then we're going to automate our bill payments, right? This is your utilities, your car note, your insurance, school loans, anything and everything automated. This way you don't uh, have late fees. This way you don't forget to pay something and have a bad mark on your credit report, right? That's what we just talked about. Um, <clears throat> next up, there's some services that I mentioned that uh, these you can use see where your money goes. So mint.com, that's something I use, get full visibility into all of my accounts, all of the charges, 
uh, get to see trends. How are we spending our money? Are we a little bit higher than normal on, on uh, utilities for some reason? And then the next one, which I did not mention yet, is, uh, and I actually, my tax advisor just told me about this one two weeks ago, is called asktrim.com. And they can help you reduce your bills, like your internet bill, your cable bill, or your medical bills. Um, the way they get paid is if they save you money, then they make a third of that, right? So for my example, uh, I said, here's my Spectrum internet bill. They called up and they got it lowered $20 a month, which equated to $240 uh, over the year of savings. So they simply charged my credit card $80. Uh, that's how they got paid. And now I simply get to keep the other $160 a month, sorry, $160 per year savings simply by having that lower rate. So consider Ask Trim uh, if, you, if you think they can work out for you. And then of course I mentioned uh, free and affordable sites to expand your skill set, right? Uh, the more you know, the more you can increase your value, right? Because your potential salary could go up based on you getting whatever it might be, this new skill with uh, coding. Excuse me, maybe you want to learn Python, uh, take a computer science course. Um, those are at edX.org. And again, University of the People. Uh, once you go there, universityofthepeople.com, they have, I think, those four degree programs that we talked about, which include associates, uh, masters, as well as your undergrad. Uh, so final slide, we can keep it moving from here, is uh, questions, right? If anybody has any questions, here's my, my personal email address. Um, again, I have nothing uh, nothing to sell, right? We've already been through that. Uh, just here to help. Maybe I know everybody's got you know personal situations, uh, and if I can help, you know, offer some uh, suggestions or things that have worked for me, then I'm happy to to do that for you as well. Uh, so simply drop me an email there. Uh, and finally, if you like this session, then consider joining me on my next session. Right? I want to take you all on a deep dive through retirement planning. Uh, it's very different, right? Here we probably covered, I don't even know how many topics, probably eight topics. Uh, we covered a whole lot. And I think, again, this is all about learning to control your money or your money will control you, right? Get those dollars controlled so they're not jumping out of your pockets and running everywhere else. And once you control them, then we can go into the next session and we can talk about how you can put those dollars to work in your 401k if your employer offers one or opening an IRA if uh, that's something uh, that you're ready to do. Or maybe you still want to keep saving at this time and moving money to your high yield account and maybe thinking about how you can uh, maybe have homeownership, right? Or get your debt paid off. So uh, cleaning house financially, getting stable, that's what this is all about. Uh, but yeah, next session, stock market, stocks, bonds, 401ks, asset allocation, um, target date funds, and robo-advisors, a little bit of everything. Uh, but that's kind of that theme. Uh, so thank you all. It's 829. I think we're almost right on time. We'll take any questions from anybody that, that has them. I'm happy to stick around. Uh, my time is yours. So um, I'll hand it over to Quincy and let's see where we go from here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. That was um, incredible and definitely a lot of information. Great job with, uh, if you consider that an overview. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now that was a lot of information. Um, and I think I, I learned, I've learned a lot and I, I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. It doesn't look like we have any questions. However, um, just to say, we will be, um, after this live stream is over, this video will exist on our page. It will also exist on our, um, this is our Facebook group right now. The live only airs first in our Facebook group. And then we will post this uh, video in our Facebook on our Facebook page, which is open to the public. And um, one thing that I'm considering, and I'll talk to you about that later, Adrian, is possibly doing a, um, what is called a watch party. So maybe we can do a watch party for people. And um, during the watch party, you can still communicate with people via um, their you know, messaging. So we'll all watch okay. together and you can actually pop up on the screen. I can pull you up on the screen of this video and you can talk, you can narrate or you can answer questions as well. If that's something you're interested in, we'll figure out a uh, day to do that maybe later this week and uh, we'll let you guys know. So let me get okay. rid of that. Okay. That's annoying. Did everybody, <laughs> get a chance to, uh, check out, did everybody get a chance to check out the final screen that at least had my personal email in case anybody has some follow-ups? Yes. Um, I can throw that to... back up really quickly. You guys see that? Yeah. And, it's, uh, uh, we can also... Sh AB. Yeah, Gmail. Go ahead, Quincy. Yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. We can also... And if anybody... Um, <laughs> 
needs it, definitely you guys know how to reach us. Um, and I will gladly share this information with you, his, his information with you. So, um, yeah, uh, this was yeah, exciting, you. Adrian. This was really exciting. I'm, I'm so grateful and happy that you did this. Um, we, we thank you. I mean, you know, we, we really do thank you for this information. Okay, yeah, somebody reposted it in the, in the comments. There we go. Hey, there it is. Yeah, 80-20. Thank you, Israel. Right? 80% of, uh, of our results come from 20% of our effort. That's where that comes from. So uh, thank you, April, for that. I appreciate it. And again, thank, thank you, everybody, you. for your time. This is fun. It's exciting. I, again, I just love helping people. So I appreciate it. You know, everybody just hanging out with me for a little bit. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Adrian. You have a good night. I will speak with you yeah. later. Um, and All once right. again, thank we you. will let you guys know when the follow-up um, live will be. Yeah. That'll work. All right, bro. <laughs> See thank you guys so much for joining us um that was incredible um and just so that you guys know there is a little ticker at the bottom and the ticker has our new instagram this hat is driving me crazy um a new instagram page that we started so you guys can go and join us follow us on our instagram page um, 21 days black. And as you guys know, the 21 days is for some of you complete and for some of you, you're just starting. So just a note for you guys who are just starting, take your time. This challenge is, is, is made for you to take day by day and do it at your own pace. Don't feel rushed, do it at your own pace. But we really, really ask that you complete the task, that you actually complete each unit in this challenge and complete the task because uh, it's valuable information there. It's valuable, valuable information for us all. And just so that you guys know, this is not the end for me once this challenge was over because as, as you know, we will continue to bring you guys content like this. Um, look out for the follow-up uh, with Adrian. And also we are going to have a real estate agent who is going to come to talk about real estate. Unfortunately, um, there was an emergency that happened. And so we, we had to postpone uh, last Sunday's live. So we're going to reschedule that. We're definitely going to get that on the books. And I have some other exciting things planned that I'm not going to announce quite yet, but you guys stay tuned, stay tuned. And once again, thank you. And you can feel free, please feel free, if you'd like, to donate through Cash App, whatever you can, $2, $5, $10. Thank you, uh, Demita Joe, for that donation earlier today. And that actually helps us pay for these live streams because they are not free. Um, but meanwhile, keep coming back, keep sharing, Keep getting people to come to 21 Days Black Challenge, the Empowerment Challenge. Get your friends signed up. We kind of slowed down a little bit there. We, we hit about 1,600 and it kind of slowed down. So we need to see more people in the group, more people going through the challenge because that's what we want to do. We want to educate our community. This is about what we do, regardless of whether we're protesting, regardless of whether um, there is a hot topic that we are angry about. Like this is what we do constantly. We cannot fall back asleep, people. So again, thank you. I'm Quincy Lanier Gosfield, and you're watching 21 Days Black live stream. And I really, really thank you guys for joining us. So have a great, great night. I am going to retire this right now.